I think it's high time we talked about how Kate Blanchett is a lesbian icon, don't you? There is nothing quite like a quality A-list actress playing gay. Actors who have garnered widespread international recognition over the years with performances that linger in the imagination, whether it's Kate's ageless elf Galadriel from Lord of the Rings as she roars her prophecy, her two turns as Queen Elizabeth I a decade apart that gained her Oscar nominations, or her roles in The Aviator and Blue Jasmine that saw her win them. Kate Blanchett has carved a career for herself as a powerful, intelligent, and new nuanced performer. And to have someone of Kate's caliber also playing gay is thrilling, perhaps because it makes us feel seen and validated not just by her choosing to play queer roles, which alone is a tactic support of the queer community, but by validation from wider society too who have celebrated her performances in these queer roles. There is buzz when someone like Kate dones the Suffolk mantle, but that alone is not why she has become a favorite of the Suffolk community, nor do I think her choosing these roles is necessarily about the characters being gay but rather because these roles allow her to explore facets that she otherwise couldn't in more heteronormative pieces of work. So, let's take a look at Kate Blanchett's queer roles, her rise to the status of lesbian icon, and how these queer roles are on the edge of exploring female-led narratives. Kate, several LGBTQ outlets have named you a lesbian icon. Why do you think that is? And are you happy for uh, Tara to further cement that status? Yeah, baby. <laughs> That's so nice. I don't, know, I don't know what it means, but it's nice. The film Carol, the story of a young shop assistant and an older woman looking to buy a Christmas present for her daughter for Christmas falling in love, was a critical darling. It gained six Oscar nominations, five Golden Globes, nine BAFTAs, and was nominated to compete for the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival, and that is but a fraction of the recognition it got. The thing it's so easy to forget because it, it, is that there's no language around that the love that the two women feel from one another. They don't neatly fit into any sub culture um, so there's no community around um, and, and therefore no dialogue or language to describe the feelings they have for one another. I love those moments on stage, on screen and in life when you dispense with language, when you sort of transcend it in a way and certainly the experience of falling in love I think defies words which is why poets, painters, musicians, you know actors have tried to describe that feeling, writers have just you know tried to um, put words to that. The film skyrocketed Kate into lesbian consciousness. There was something about Kate playing the mysterious and elegant Carol with palpable chemistry with her co-lead Rooney Mara set in the conservatism of 1950s with its lyrical shock composition, its use of colour and lighting that evoked a kind of old world nostalgia but with a subject that would never have been made in that time period that was all too seductive. Our love of a good age gap love story is pretty well known in Suffolk circles which has made mediocre films like Loving Annabelle enduringly popular. In fact, the very first sapphic film to ever be made in 1931, Mädchen in Uniform, also sported a similar age gap. Combine that with a tendency for sapphics to thirst after middle-aged actresses playing gay, and it's a recipe for success. In short, Carol is the kind of film sapphics love. It's a period drama with lesbians sporting a good age gap played by A-list actors. Therefore, Kate's turn as Carol had many of us already primed to accept her into lesbians lesbian icon status with open arms. But while her masterful performance of Sapphic Desire certainly lit the fire, I think it was a few other circumstances around it that fanned the flames. Kate Blanchett gave an interview to Variety in 2015 prior to Carol's release where she was asked if this was her first turn as a lesbian and apparently she indicated that she may have had relationships with women in her private life. This spread across the internet as these things surely do and you best believe that our Sapphic ears perked up when we heard that. She then later revealed that it was, in fact, said in jest and then misinterpreted. I mean, I was asked by a journalist, speaking to what we were saying earlier, is that, you know, I couldn't possibly have played um, someone with feelings towards a woman unless I'd had those feelings myself. So I think I was just pointing to the ridiculousness of the question, which the, he, the journalist actually got the irony, but then obviously the internet doesn't. It didn't much matter that the rumours were not true. The seed was already planted in our fertile imaginations. So with that being the state of things, Kate then agreed to play Lou in Ocean's 8, the star-studded all-female version of the heist franchise. Apparently in earlier iterations of the film, Lou was meant to be queer but rewrites had that more or less disappear. 
However, there was some lingering evidence that could well be interpreted as sapphic. There was, of course, the pantsuits that Lou wore that sure gave a vibe. But then there was the strong sense that Lou and Debbie had a romantic history and a certain chemistry along with it. Oh, honey, is this a proposal? Baby, I don't have a timing yet. But more than that was Kate's flirty antics during promotion. Whether it was her riffing off the very out Sarah Paulson to the point that some of the interviews became almost nonsensical, or the way Kate insinuated things and flirted with Sandra Bullock a number of times. I would have to dip into Kate's a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would, Nora, Nora had some time. great pieces. You realize that there's a certain gaze that, 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 that looks at women and, and sort of one. plays into that one. Mm -hmm. That one. I'm so sick of that one. I know, I'm sorry, but you draw it out of me. No. See, Danny doesn't find me sexy. No. You don't find me sexy? The press for this movie only served to solidify Kate as a queer ally and lesbian icon. And these flirtations didn't stop there. What is it about you? What? That I sit here and suddenly I'm... <clears throat> about the this movie. is going nowhere. All right. Yeah, no, Fast. It, it would definitely go somewhere. I'm but... married! Right. Pair that with a prom picture taken out of the 2023 Film Independent Spirit Awards and that time where Kate went through a rainbow of pantsuits and we have the makings of a bona fide lesbian icon. So you can imagine our collective delight when it was announced that she'd play gay again in the 2023 film Tar. This looked at a fictional account of an eminent conductor who uses her power to seduce women. The film itself, being a cerebral meditation on power rather than centering a lesbian love story, has made it far less successful with us sapphics. Or more accurately, I've seen far fewer Tumblr gift sets about the movie and it's not necessarily topping the best lesbian films list of 2023 that I've seen so far. But this film, I feel, perfectly encapsulates how playing queer can ride the edge of female-led storytelling and how actors like Kate Blanchett might gravitate to these stories for the freedom they offer as an actress. I mean, when acting works, when performance works, when theatre's great, when films connect, it expands, whether it's a, a piece of profound satire or a, a work of great drama, it, it expands what, what it means to be human. It expands our ability to be compassionate, I think. If you look at the trailer for the film The Aviator, which won Kate her first Oscar, it is clear that this film does not centre the female narrative. It is firstly and primarily a Leonardo DiCaprio vehicle. Her role in big budget movies like Lord of the Rings or Thor equally have her playing secondary to male protagonists, which is perhaps why she chose to play Queen Elizabeth I twice, because these roles offer her star billing with a complex and multi-layered character. Her desire to play such roles is evident from the beginning of her career when she played in David Mamet's play Oleana for the Sydney Theatre Company in 1993 opposite Jeffrey Rush, which is a play about the power struggle between a professor and one of his students. We can also see it in characters like Richard III or Jasmine in Jasmine Blue. It's why I think she's leaned into unlikable characters like Phyllis in Mrs. America or why she's delved into Lydia Tarr. Her interest lies in the ability to delve into the nuances of human psychology and explore the boundaries of storytelling. So the the fact that Carol and Lydia are gay, I would say, is incidental to why she chose to play them when viewed from this perspective. Her internal machinations, and that's what's so thrilling to play, are very, very private. And often, I think her motivations are quite hidden from herself. And the thing that I found quite heartrending about the characters is that they are incredibly, forget their gender, they're very, very isolated as women. What I love about the, the, the story that Todd has, has uh, wrought and the way he's directed it and the way we approached it is it was just their, their same-sex relationship was just completely, it just the way it just was. There was no, it's, it's not the subject matter of the film, um, you know, nor is the other character's gender the subject matter of the film. It's a meditation on power. But I would also argue that the sapphic nature of these two characters are central to the complexity that attracted her to them in the first place. But he started showing Rooney and I all of these extraordinary underground female photographers in the 50s. You know, so it was a very female gaze that he was using in the piece. And To offer a female gaze, it has to take away the male one. And with a history of centering male stories, an entry point into these kinds of narratives is most easily done by removing the male character. In Carol, we have the boyfriend and the husband, but they are peripheral. They have no life of their own beyond their roles to provide friction for the protagonists. The emotional core of the movie revolves around the two ladies and when Carol does reach out to anyone else for emotional support, it's her ex-lover and friend played by Sarah Paulson. 
While Carol is certainly not an anomaly for having a queer narrative at its centre, in 2015 it is this fact that made it so fresh and exciting for critics and rode that cutting edge of female-led stories. It explored female love and desire outside of the prism of the male experience. Today that kind of story might have less impact as narratives around women and about sapphic women have become more commonplace. Therefore it feels like a natural evolution for Kate to then do Tar. Tar is certainly a different kind of exploration of that female narrative. Here it investigates a story that is almost always given to men. It looks at power and the ability for status to corrupt, at the fall from grace that comes from that hubris of believing that you can get away with your transgressions, and so while it may not play to the female gaze in the same way as Carol does, it does add to the female-led narrative by offering up a flawed, unlikable character who is as flawed and unlikable as the multitude of male anti-heroes that exist. In essence, it allows the ability of power to corrupt to be not just a male characteristic, but a human one. Much of Kate's interviews revolve around the central thesis of power, and the fact that the role she plays as a lesbian is given much less importance, often not even mentioned. But it would have felt like a very different film if her wife had actually been a husband, because of the inherent gender power dynamics and societal expectations that are placed on women and mothers. Here, she is not judged or punished as a woman or a mother for focusing on her career and being frequently absent. She is in fact afforded the same leniency that a man would be in the same situation, which is most potently seen by how the film ends where, and spoiler if you haven't seen the film, click off if you don't want to know, she certainly fell off her pedestal, but her career is not ruined. She is still able to pursue that which she had dedicated her life's work to doing, which is conducting. She is humbled but not punished, unlike say Marla in I Care A Lot or Villanelle in Killing Eve. This then too becomes a role that rides that cutting edge of where female stories are at today, especially as this kind of storytelling for women is only now beginning to emerge as older actresses are allowed to exist on screens. It is really only with Kate Blanchett's generation of actresses that we are beginning to see women age on screen and remain leading ladies, offering up the kind of nuance and depth of character for a demographic of society that have largely been relegated to supporting roles as mothers and grandmothers in the past. Do you agree that Kate is a lesbian icon? And who else would you nominate for this category? I might just make a wee series out of this if there is interest. Until next time, lady lovers.